the uh, subcommittee will come to order and uh, welcome Dr. Frieden. Uh, and good afternoon. Today's hearing will examine a deadly phenomenon involving both natural and man-made elements, diseases that are resistant to most or all available methods of treatment. While this is a growing problem of increasing concern throughout the world, the subcommittee will be focusing today on the impact of such diseases known as superbugs in developing countries and the challenge to preventing and treating these diseases in this part of the world. There is a family of germs that occur normally in everyone's digestive system. They can cause infections when they get into the bladder, blood, or other areas where they don't belong. There is, that is the natural part of the, this growing problem. Gut flora are absolutely essential for health and an effectively functioning immune response and the increasing use of things like probiotics uh, is testimony to the fact that more and more people are, are understanding that. There are about 100 trillion microorganisms in our, in our digestive systems, 10 times the number of cells in our bodies. Most of them help break down the foods that we eat. They help us with our immune systems. Uh, those that are not helpful are usually can be treated with existing medicines such as antibiotics. The man-made part of it is that antibiotics has, have been increasingly used to treat naturally occurring germs, but many of them have become resistant to such treatment. These so-called superbugs pose a threat because of overuse or misuse of antibiotics, but they also pose a threat because of what some call a dis drug discovery void, in which there has been insufficient research and development of new medicines to treat emerging mutating infections. This situation recently has become much more serious. In the last 10 years, these drug resistant diseases have been identified in patients in more than 200 hospitals in 42 states in this country. Over that period, their prevalence rate has increased from 1% of patients to some 4% for those in short-term care, but for patients in long-term care, long care facilities, the rate is as high as 18%. Half of all patients who contract these diseases do not survive. MRSA, one of the better known of these superbugs, now kills as many as 19,000 Americans each year and a similar number in Europe. That is higher than the annual rate of deaths from HIV and AIDS. Last year, the World Health Organization identified strains of gonorrhea and tuberculosis that are currently completely untreatable, as well as a new wave of what might be called super superbugs when the mutation known as NDMI. These frightening new strains were first seen in India, but they have now spread worldwide. The spread of the HN, uh, H7N9 bird flu in China is also causing considerable concern, with more than 100 confirmed cases and 22 deaths reported thus far. According to the AFP, WHO said yesterday that there was still no evidence that H7N9 was spreading in a sustained way between people uh, in China. And I know Dr. Frieden will speak to that uh, because we are working with the Chinese on that issue. According to WHO, artemisinin, when used in combination with other drugs, is now considered the world's best treatment against malaria. But malarial parasites resistant to the drug have emerged in western Cambodia along the border in Thailand as well in parts of Burma and in Vietnam. In the developed world, we pride ourselves on having top flight medical care widely available to patients. If we lose half of all patients who contract these drug-resistant diseases, uh, what about patients in the developing world where statistics are often scarce and effective medical care can even be scarcer? Using accepted protocols for treating these diseases, their rate of infection can be curbed. In Israel, infection rates in all 27 of its hospitals fell by more than 70 percent in one year with a coordinated prevention program. By following accepted protocols for handling these diseases, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and the Florida Department of Health both have stopped outbreaks of these drug resistance diseases in recent years. But then again, what about hospitals in developing countries? For example, the brain drain has sent trained medical personnel in Africa in search of better working conditions and pay uh, in the developed world. The lack of equipment and supplies that partly led to this brain drain would facilitate the rapid spread of drug resistant diseases in these countries. What would be simple interventions, including removing temporary medical devices such as catheters or ventilators from patients as soon as possible, is less likely under current conditions in developing world hospitals. 
Adding to this problem is the presence of expired and counterfeit drugs. Patients who live, whose lives, I should say, could be saved may not be because of inadequate medical care. Unfortunately, because so many countries do not maintain and report statistics on medical issues, we have little idea how serious the situation is today in many developing countries in Africa and elsewhere around the world. In our inter interconnected world, that means that infected people in the developing and developed countries pose a mutual threat. Last month, a Nepalese man, man who was detained at the Texas border while trying to make an illegal crossing from Mexico. Officials found that he was infected with an, an extensively drug-resistant strain of tuberculosis and had carried this potentially deadly airborne disease through some 13 countries over three months from his home of Nepal through South Asia, Brazil, Mexico, and finally into the United States. Who can say how many people he infected during this long journey? Conversely, six years ago, an American infected with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis traveled from our country to France, Greece, and Italy before returning through the Czech Republic and Canada. Upon his return to the United States, he became the first person subjected to a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention isolation order since 1963. Clearly, both developed and developing nations must work together to prevent and treat these diseases and find a way to implement the new strategies in an era of constrained budgets and loosening control of authority in far too many countries. However, the administration's proposed budget for 2014 does call for a 19 percent cut in tuberculosis programming, and hopefully we might get some answers today and again on Thursday uh, from Dr. Shaw. Today's witness, a very accomplished uh, doctor, heads an agency that is charged with examining the elements of disease and helping to develop the strategies for addressing the threats they pose, not just to Americans, but to all mankind. We look forward to hearing from Dr. Friedan, Friedan I should say, and explaining, exploring with him the means by which the U.S. government is working with developing countries to counter global threats. I'd like to yield to Ms. Mass. Um, thank you, and Mr. Chairman, as always, I want to thank you for convening today's hearing on drug-resistant diseases in developing countries. While we examine this very serious issue, I think it's worth noting that this is an issue with global dimensions that impacts all of us. While we sit in the halls of Congress, we're neither immune nor are we protected from what is a mere plane ride from this hearing room. Globalization has done much for allowing us to be more interconnected. The challenge before us today, however, is how do we understand and move to effectively address the smallest of things, microscopic organisms that have the ability to rapidly adapt and either avoid detection or resist efforts that would eliminate something that often has mortal consequences if left unaddressed. Uh, Dr. Frieden, I want to thank you for taking the time today to testify before the committee. I remember us talking about a very similar subject uh, about a year ago, so I'm very glad that you're here today. Uh, we all know that you've dedicated your life to addressing the great public health challenges of our day. You have been on the cutting edge of public health interventions and have un undoubtedly saved millions of lives in the U.S. and around the world. For an extraordinary depth of work and experience, we owe you our thanks and look forward to your testimony. Uh, without objection, I would like to submit for the record a written statement by Ranking Member Engel. Uh, he's been a staunch champion on a number of global health priorities, and in particular, the spread of tuberculosis, both multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant TB. It would be remiss for me not to acknowledge that in my hometown of Los Angeles, there has been a recent outbreak of TB, and I understand it's close to 5,000 people that have been diagnosed and there is a concern that there's not a sufficient supply of drug treatment to address this outbreak. Dr. Frieden, perhaps in your remarks you can update us all on, this, on the situation and how the CDC is working with local officials. I'm sure Los Angeles is not the only city that is dealing with this. But I will note that in the U.S. alone, there are over 10,000 cases of TB infection annually. In a country like India, four times our population size, there are approximately 2.3 million cases each year and close to half a million people can die from it. The Wall Street Journal reports that India has the largest number of people infected with drug-resistant strains. In 2010, the Center for Global Development wrote a paper entitled The Race Against Drug Resistance, and in that paper, the authors address the health and economic consequences of global drug resistance, 
the drivers of drug resistance, and the current global response to the problem. They concluded with four recommendations that I'd like to read uh, for the committee's consideration, but also to get your feedback on. Um, recommendation one, improve surveillance by collecting and sharing resistance information across network of laboratories. Two, secure the drug supply chain to ensure quality products and practices. Three, strengthen national drug regulatory authorities in developing countries. And four, catalyze research and innovation to speed the development of resistance fighting technologies. The challenge before us is multifaceted and will require a comprehensive approach. Understanding the drivers of drug resistance and addressing them is critical, including strengthening health systems to include well-trained and equitably distributed health workers who can properly administer uh, treatments. Eliminating substandards and counterfeit drugs, and I would in particular like if you could comment about the role that, you've, that counterfeit drugs might play in this. Uh, we need to have well-structured surveillance and reporting systems that are in track to monitor outbreaks and infections, and a strong focus on research development. Uh, I would add that public and private sectors must also play their part to ensure financial resources and regulatory standards are in place for the challenges of today. In Africa, for example, you don't have to look very far to find stories that report on totally drug-resistant TB or emerging concerns of increased drug resistance strains of HIV and malaria. These troubling trends, as these are troubling trends as our nation continues to fund programs that we hope will end these crises in our lifetime. We've heard President Obama and former Secretary of State uh, Clinton speak of an AIDS-free generation, while at the same time you read a BBC article with the headline, Drug Resistance HIV on Increase in Sub-Saharan Africa. The World Health Organization reports that India, China, the Russian Federation, and South Africa are home to almost 60% of the world's cases of multi-drug resistant TB. I would love to know your opinions, number one, if you agree with that or if, if you uh, have a sense of why that is. Uh, when we consider that combined India and China are home to over one-third of the global population of 2.6 billion people. This problem won't go away on, our, on its own, and we continue to see people becoming infected with any number of diseases, and as our world continues to become smaller as a result of globalization, we will continue to be confronted with the challenges of how to adequately deal with drug resistance that may or may not be on our doorstep today, but might be tomorrow. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you, Ms. Bass. Uh, Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a, a timely hearing on an important issue, and uh, Dr. Frieden, I appreciate your willingness to be here as well, and I look forward to your testimony. Obviously, drug resistance diseases are a serious problem everywhere. Um, you know, our own health care providers are struggling to stay on top of this issue on a daily basis. and. I, you know, I firmly believe that uh, to address this problem, we must first determine the scale of the problem. And, uh, you know, we need to make sure and ensure that we have the, the data necessary both uh, to here and in the developing world to properly define the problem. Uh, these drug-resistant diseases, uh, you know, they don't recognize a political boundary, uh, you know, in a, in a globalized world, you know, that we live in. You know, a threat anywhere is a threat here. And so, therefore, we're, we're bound to work on this problem uh, wherever it presents itself, and, and, and that obviously creates challenges. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, we know that developing countries may struggle with, you know, sanitary practices, the use of uh, non-prescribed antibiotics, limited, care to ac uh, to limited access to care, you know, and so on. And so I look forward to uh, hearing how we can address those challenges and improve our knowledge you know, of, of these severe threats. And with that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Dr. Burr. Chairman Smith, thank you. And again, thank you for calling this hearing. It, it is extremely timely. timely. Um, and today I'll be a doctor as opposed to, to a congressman because that is really how I look at, at this issue from the perspective of being a doctor. Um, you know, as, as the former chief medical officer for Sacramento County, we dealt with issues of um, drug-resistant tuberculosis. But five or six years ago, we could actually, you know, we had second and third line medications that, you know, we could use judiciously and still deal with these cases when we were called into consultation um, in the hospital. 
What keeps me awake at night and what I worry about is the emergence of extremely drug resistant cases of tuberculosis that we're starting to see pop up in, um, in Africa and other nations around the globe. And that is of critical concern, not only um, to those countries uh, abroad in Africa, but clearly to um, our hospitals and our patients here domestically. It is a real issue and it is one that um, we have to take very seriously. Um, you know, I've seen it firsthand, having traveled to South Africa a few years ago with a, a group of doctors to, you know, evaluate how they were caring for the HIV epidemic there. Um, you're seeing um, the devastating effects uh, uh, of these cases and, and the limited resources in the arsenal. The other thing that keeps me awake at night, and, and I saw it firsthand this past weekend when I was back home and um, rounding with a, a group of doctors at um, Mercy San Juan Hospital, seeing, seeing what was happening there. Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, the nurse administrator who was rounding with us suggested that close to 50% of the, the, the patients that they're admitting now have a history of MRSA, so methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So there is a, a real concern um, of the efficacy of the antibiotics that, that we're using. and. Um, starting to run out of those, um, those tools in our arsenal uh, as physicians. Um, that leads me to another body of literature that, that really is emerging. As we incent um, our pharmaceutical companies to come up with the, the fourth generation of antibiotics, we really have to extend the life of these medications. And um, you know, I've been a doctor for over 20 years and you know, for years we could use penicillin and so forth, but now as we get into our, our first, second, third generation of cephalosporins and antibiotics, the lifespan of these drugs are increasingly shorter and shorter. And part of that is the ease of access of antibiotics in third world countries, you know, the ability to just buy them over the counter um, and there's no guarantee that they're being used in an appropriate manner. So we have to work with industry to make sure as we come up with these next generation of antibiotics, we are very judicious in how they're used, not only here domestically, but also abroad in other countries. And I'd be interested in, in hearing your testimony on all of these issues, what we can do proactively here in Congress, as well as our medical community to address that next generation of tuberculosis resistant, but then also how we work with industry as we develop the fourth generation of antibiotics and make sure we can extend the lives of, of these um, medications. And with that, Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for, for this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Burr. Uh, Mr. Weber? I'm good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to now extend a very special welcome to Dr. Frieden. Uh, Tom Frieden, medical doctor, MPH, who has been the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention since June of 2009 has controlled both infectious and chronic diseases in his country and globally. From 1992 to 1996, he led the New York City's program that controlled tuberculosis and reduced multi-drug resistant cases by 80 percent. Dr. Frieden then worked in India for five years helping to build a tuberculosis control program that has saved nearly three million lives. As Commissioner of the New York City Health Department from 2002 to 2009, Dr. Frieden led programs that reduced illness and death and increased life expectancy substantially, including programs that reduced adult and teen smoking dramatically and eliminated artificial trans fats from restaurants. The department eliminated racial ethnic disparities in colon cancer screening and began the country's largest community-based electronic health records project. As C CDC director, Dr. Frieden has intensified CDC's 24-7 work to save lives and protect people, including through more effective response to outbreaks and other health threats at the local, state, federal, and global levels. New programs have prevented infections from food and health care, helped Americans quit smoking, reduced childhood uh, uh, obesity, and saved lives of teens and others from car crashes and extended life-saving treatment and disease prevention in more than 50 countries. A graduate of Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons and School of Public Health, Dr. Frieden completed infectious disease training at Yale University and CDC's Epidemic Intelligence Service. The recipient of numerous awards and honors, Dr. Frieden speaks Spanish and has published more than 200 scientific articles. And we welcome him back. And um, the floor is yours, Doc. 
Thank you so very much, uh, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Bass, and the other members of the committee, uh, both for your support for global health issues and for this opportunity to speak with you today about such important threats that we face and the important work that the CDC does in this country and around the world to protect Americans 24-7. CDC's work is critical to addressing antimicrobial resistance and other global threats. What I'd like to do here is briefly outline what the problem is, what we're doing about it, and what more needs to be done in three broad sections. Um, obviously, any one of those three could take a lot of time, so I'll just give you some of the highlights, and I would uh, really agree with all of what was said in the introductory comments from the chair, the ranking member, and the panel. This is a critical problem for us. If there's one basic concept, uh, it is that we are inevitably interconnected as a world. And whether we like it or not, whether drugs are used correctly all over the world affects what happens to people in our communities. I think we're facing essentially a perfect storm of vulnerability. There are four trends that are combining to make us in some ways at greater risk than we've ever been in the past. The first is the emergence and spread of new microbes, things like SARS and H7N9 influenza, which I can speak about later if you'd like. The second is globalization of travel, where people just a plane ride away can bring new organisms and resistant organisms from one part of the world to another. And also globalization of our food and medical supply, we're increasingly interconnected. The third and the main topic of this hearing is the inexorable rise of drug resistance. We now face an increasing rate of resistance in many different types of organisms. Uh, to mention just three, we have tuberculosis strains, and tuberculosis is an area that I worked in for many years, uh, that are resistant to virtually all antibiotics. We have strains of gram-negative organisms a, class, uh, a group, a, a problem referred to as CRE, or, or carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae, basically very dangerous bacteria that are now resistant to most or even all antibiotics and are spreading in our country. And third, malaria, where we're now beginning to see resistance to the last best drug we have to treat it on an outpatient basis. Uh, the artemisinin drugs and that class of drugs. There are about 12 million Americans a year who go visit malaria areas, areas where they are at risk for getting malaria. If these resistant strains spread, the risk to people in this country will be substantial in addition to the number of deaths and the amount of suffering and economic hardship that that will cause around the world. The fourth risk is the potential of people either intentionally or unintentionally to create dangerous organisms and then to release those into the environment either intentionally or unintentionally. And unfortunately, that has become easier as we've had technological advances. Poor quality treatment, whether of tuberculosis or of pneumonia in the hospital, anywhere in the world, in Asia or Africa, can and in fact has become a nightmare in communities in the U.S. Today, in many communities, most likely each of the communities that you represent in this country, there is someone in a nursing home or a hospital who is fighting for their life against an infection that doctors have limited or no tools to treat. And as we saw, for example, in Colorado, where there was an outbreak recently the index patient had just come from Asia and undoubtedly had brought that organism with them through no fault of the individual and unavoidably. Given the four big challenges that we face, I think there are two broad areas that give me a great deal of hope for being able to tackle them in the future. One is frankly political and one is technological. On the political side, I think we have more commitment to addressing this in more countries than we've ever had before. The SARS outbreak cost the world 
more than $30 billion. H7N9 avian influenza in less than a month has cost China more than $2 billion. So I think countries get that in addition to the human suffering, there are strong economic incentives to address health threats more effectively. In addition, uh, we have global commitments through things like the international health regulations, which require countries of the world to find, report, and stop disease threats. And we're getting reporting from an increasing number of countries. We're nowhere near where we need to be, but we have the political framework to provide the support and assistance so that the world can be safer because each of the countries around us is safer and each of the countries in the world is safer. And also in terms of the commitment, we have success stories, and I'll go into some of them, but we've seen that when we work with China or Thailand or Brazil or many, many other countries and help them see what needs to be done, they invest their own resources, their own substantial talent, their own capacities in doing that so that we end up with a true partnership to reduce health risks both for their country and for the whole world. The second broad reason for optimism is the advances in both laboratory work and informatics. They're breathtaking. We are able to do things in the laboratory now that we could not have even dreamed of even just a few years ago. When I started at the CDC as an epidemic intelligence service officer, we were just beginning to do a genetic sequencing of tiny parts of the genome and to use that to figure out how tuberculosis and other organisms were spreading and to stop them sooner. It took a large room, months of work, a lot of very difficult comparison by hand sometimes of different patterns. Now, much more information can be obtained in just three or four hours. In the President's budget for fiscal 14, there's an initiative called Advanced Molecular Detection. This in initiative would allow us to go to this next generation of tools, find outbreaks that we're missing now, find them sooner, stop them more effectively, and figure out how they're spreading so we can prevent more of them. This is our single highest priority for the 14 budget at CDC. And in addition, there are really exciting bioinformatics developments where we can look at huge amounts of data and begin to make sense of it. So I think we have real reasons for optimism. In terms of what CDC is doing today, uh, Ambassador Carson, the, special, the recently retired former ambassador to Africa, said to me, CDC is the 911 for the world. And we're happy to play that role, but we're even happier that we're now teaching countries to do that for themselves. And we're doing that in critical ways and with important platforms. And I want to thank the chairman, ranking member, and all members of the committee for your steadfast support for the PEPFAR program over the years. PEPFAR is really changing the world. There are more than 5.3 million people alive today who would be dead or dying otherwise. Last year alone, a quarter of a million babies were born without HIV because of PEPFAR. And in order to do what we've done with PEPFAR, with the leadership of the State Department and the Global AIDS Coordinator, in order to have those results, we've also used PEPFAR as a platform. We've come in under budget and ahead of schedule, but we've also used PEPFAR as a platform to strengthen laboratories for HIV and for other conditions, to strengthen diagnosis, to strengthen maternal and child health. And what we've seen with that, for example, is strengthening through PEPFAR, excuse me, and also through the Global Disease Detection Program, which is a CDC program that is a platform to find and stop outbreaks. We've seen strengthening of laboratories, which are crucial, of epidemiologists or disease detectives who are essential to finding and stopping problems, and of prevention measures. And just to mention a few of them, through the laboratory work, we now have created an African Society for Laboratory Medicine. Hundreds and soon thousands of laboratories throughout Africa will be certified so doctors and patients can rely on accurate results. Do they have an infection or not? Is it resistant or not? Is treatment working or not? Right now, without good laboratories, you can't answer those questions in far too much of the world. We're also expanding influenza surveillance throughout Asia and Africa so that we can get a better handle on where it's emerging, how it's happening. Um, we know that a risk anywhere can be a risk everywhere. 
And though we've worked with 50 countries on influenza surveillance, we were taken off guard by H1N1, which emerged in Mexico. We've expected new influenza strains to emerge in China and Southeast Asia, as H7 is now. But H1 took us by surprise, and that emphasizes a key point, which is that a blind spot anywhere is a risk to all of us. But our laboratory work at CDC has strengthened work throughout the world so that there is much more accurate diagnosis. I'll give you one example of this that CDC is doing with Uganda right now. Our CDC lab in Fort Collins, Colorado, came up with a new way to diagnose plague. Plague is often fatal. But with a simple $1 dipstick test, we are determining whether patients have plague. Uh, CDC is working with local traditional healers. We're working with the uh, medical care system. And CDC is also working to see what treatment is best for plague. As a result, in just the past few months, we've diagnosed people who would likely have died otherwise and treated them before they've spread plague to others. And we're transferring this technology to Uganda so that they don't need for us to do it in the future, as we've done with Ebola, as an example. We've taught them how to control it, how to diagnose it. So instead of the large outbreaks that we saw a decade ago, we're seeing isolated cases or smaller outbreaks now. The second key area is epidemiology, disease detectives. And this is so crucial to what we do, figuring out where disease is spreading, what the threats are, how to stop them, and whether our efforts are working. Our flagship program in epidemiology at the CDC is the Epidemic Intelligence Service. What we've done with more than 30 countries is help them start similar programs called field epidemiology training programs. Uh, in the next year or two, we will graduate the 3,000th disease detective. It's a two-year intensively mentored program. 80% of the graduates stay in their home country, often in leadership positions, finding and stopping health threats. We also do epidemiologic investigations. And we start, on average, one of these a day in this country, and on average, with our partners, one a day around the world to identify and stop a new threat. And third is prevention. And we do this in important ways, including vaccination. After all, if you vaccinate and prevent an infection from happening, it won't be resistant. And we're seeing that with, for example, pneumococcal infections. Now, with vaccination, resistance is less of a concern in that one organism. And of course, we're closer than ever to the finish line in, in polio eradication and the work of Rotary International and so many partners with CDC as the spearheading partner for this country has brought us to this point from 1988 when there were more than 350,000 children affected by polio in that year alone to last year when there were 222, the lowest number ever in the history of humanity as far as we know. Um, we're also active in quarantine, identifying passengers who are ill and helping to reduce risks of people who come here from other countries. That's some of what we at CDC are doing. In terms of what more is needed, I have to say, frankly, that we're not keeping pace with the threats. Microbes evolve and emerge rapidly, and we need to keep pace with that evolution. What we're faced with is a need to accelerate progress in three specific areas. The first is detection. We need to implement, we need to fund and implement the Advanced Molecular Detection Program. I brought for you a remarkable thing. This is a chip. It's one company. It just fits very easily to carry. There are about five different companies that make something like this. But this chip, in less than four hours, can sequence the entire genome of not just one, but many different microbes. And with advanced supercomputing, we can then take, there are actually more than 10 million individual wells on this chip. We can take the fragments of DNA and with a supercomputer, put them back together like a jigsaw puzzle with tens of thousands of pieces to figure out where the connections are, whether it's resistant, how it's spreading, and whether it's becoming more virulent. We're using this technology now to track H7N9 uh, and this is the kind of thing that we need to invest in more to make an even bigger difference going forward. We have too many blind spots. Second, we need to improve our ability to respond to infectious disease and other threats. At CDC, we have an emergency operations center. And if any of you are ever passing through Atlanta, please come by and spend an hour or two with us. 
uh, to see what we do there. We track what's happening around the world. We have an information system. We have a communication system. We respond rapidly. Ideally, every, system, every country in the world should have some system like that. They'll be safer and we'll be safer. And third, we need to increase our ability to prevent through better vaccines, through antibiotic stewardship, through better supply chain control in terms of antibiotics. So I'll, I'll be happy to get into specific issues that you've raised. Uh, I don't want to take too much time with my introductory statement, but I do want to conclude with one simple thought, which is that a safer United States and a safer world is within reach if we invest in it, if we work with partners, if we take advantage of the unique opportunities that both the commitment of countries around the world has and this very exciting technology that we have to bring to bear on long-standing threats to our health. Thank you so much for your interest. Thank you so very much, Doctor. And without objection, your full written statement will be made a part of the record as well as that of uh, Ranking Member Elliot Engel. Let me just ask you a couple of opening questions. Um, Artemisinin's, um, the, the power of that very important drug to, uh, to help cure people with malaria uh, has been maybe thrown a, a huge curveball in, as I said earlier, uh, in Cambodia, Burma, and particularly along the Thai um, um, uh, border. And my, my question is, you know, there's 104 malaria endemic countries. Obviously, and you know because you've been a part of this, we went from $100 million in the year 2000 to $1.8 billion worldwide uh, in 2012, um, certainly below what the, what the target was if we wanted to really look to eradicate this horrible disease. But how concerned are you and, and CDC um, about this problem? I know WHO talks about containment and, and trying to ensure that this is not spread to other places, particularly Africa, where it would be even more catastrophic. If you could spend some time on, on, on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your support for the President's Malaria Initiative. I've seen, as you have, this program in action in Africa and elsewhere, and it is breathtaking. Uh, I've gone into communities that previously had extensive amounts of malaria. CDC has documented that in some of these communities, one out of every four medical visits of children was for malaria. One out of every two units of blood used for transfusion was for malaria. And in communities where they've implemented good control measures, we've seen essentially zero cases of malaria with good control and zero deaths. So we know that tremendous progress is possible. We're quite concerned about artemisinin resistance. We've seen areas, as you say, in Cambodia and elsewhere where as many as 30% of patients have evidence that their particular strain of malaria is responding much less well to the artemisinins. This is our last hope for good malaria control. We have to preserve this drug. I think you can think of drug resistance and prevention of drug resistance as something that we owe the world, we owe our children, that these antibiotics that we've been bequeathed by people who worked so hard to come up with them are preserved and can be used to protect lives for many years going forward. What we think is possible is first to understand better what's happened and second to contain as well as possible through a comprehensive approach to vector control, that is stopping the mosquito treating effectively, diagnosing and treating well. And I think overall with malaria, we're quite, um, quite uh, reassured by the overall amount of progress that's happening. The challenge with malaria is the challenge of persistence. We've seen big progress with malaria before. We let up our guard and it came roaring back. Yeah. That's exactly what we have to avoid. We have to intensify our work in Southeast Asia to understand and contain artemisinin resistance. At the same time, we have to scale up the core malaria control interventions uh, in Asia and Africa especially so that we can reduce the number of deaths and the burden of illness. There's still a lot we know that we're not doing, and we need to scale up bed net use and high quality diagnosis and treatment. There's still certain things that we know, but we don't know that we need to understand better about the malaria parasite, about the best tools to control it. And isn't it true that about half of those who should have bed nets have it, but we are running into the problem of the bed nets now losing their, their efficacy to, to keep the mosquitoes out? 
So we need a replacement effort as well. CDC scientists have looked at this carefully. The, the life of a bed net is not an easy one. They get right. embers put on them from the local, from the stove, they're worn out. And so having the first set of nets out was great and knocked down child mortality enormously. We've documented at CDC uh, overall reductions, not malaria specific, but overall reductions in child deaths of 25% just from the malaria control program. But exactly as you say, Mr. Chairman, the nets now need to be replaced, and that requires resources. You know, in terms of drugs that are actually in the pipeline, you know, we know that newer orders of, of, of uh, new types of antibiotics are few and in between. On tuberculosis, uh, without objection, we're including testimony from Dr. Uh, Adrian Thomas uh, from uh, Johnson & Johnson, and he points out that uh, Janssen is bringing forward a new medicine specifically indicated to treat a drug-resistant form of tuberculosis. It's called Certuro. Um, it, it seems to have gone, or it has gone, to uh, uh, the next stage, although it's not used yet. My, my, my question on that drug and it, specifically and other drugs that are or not in the pipeline, particularly as it relates to malaria and uh, multi-resistant uh, tuberculosis, multi-drug. I, I think w a key concept is that the development of new antimicrobials, new antibiotics, is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. Now, for those two conditions particularly, we're very encouraged. It's the first new anti-tuberculosis drug in decades. Uh, we think at this point it should be reserved for people who, uh, for whom other drugs are not uh, available. The CDC has convened national experts to look at what is the optimal way of using this new drug. We'll need to have some clinical trials. And the FDA moved very quickly to approve it so that patients could get it and their lives could be saved. Uh, there are some other drugs for tuberculosis that are in the pipeline that are somewhat encouraging. But uh, what we know is unless we improve our treatment system, we will lose those drugs as well. In terms of malaria, the situation is perhaps a little less encouraging because virtually everything in the pipeline is either an artemisinin-related uh, product, a synthetic artemisinin, or something that has the same resistance mechanisms as the artemisinins appear to have. So if we lose the artemisinins, we may lose the new drugs before we even get them. And I think this comes back to one of the core concepts of antimicrobial resistance. Resistance develops because of poor quality programs. It's very straightforward. Um, if you have a good quality program, you will not get lots of drug resistance. And in tuberculosis, which I worked in for many years, one of the core concepts is that a poor quality program can create multidrug resistance faster than a good program can treat it, no matter how many resources you have. And it's critically important to stop resistance from emerging and then to stop it from spreading. We documented in New York City in the early 1990s that as many as half of all of the multidrug resistant tuberculosis patients had actually caught it in the hospital. So hospitals can become an amplification point for drug resistance. That's why in our work in this country and our recommendations to other countries, we've advocated a program called Detect and Protect. Detect and Protect, it's a simple concept. Find the patients that have the resistant organisms, protect them from harm with it, and protect other patients from getting it from them. And one of the things that we're encouraged by is the amount of progress in uh, things like methicillin-resistant staph aureus, where since 2005, we've documented a more than 50% reduction in the serious infections with that highly resistant organism. This is not a problem for which we have no solution. We know what to do. It's a question of doing it. We also need some new knowledge, but what we can do now is a much better job at reducing the risk of detecting it so we find the patients who have it and of protecting others from them and protecting them from the organism. Dr. Frieden, you've made a very strong appeal to Congress to include in its budget what is in the FY 2014 uh, President's budget for the Advanced Molecular Detection Initiative. As you point out, it combines two powerful technologies, molecular sequencing and bioinformatics. Could you uh, perhaps elaborate on exactly how that works? And if you could also, um, and then I'll yield to my colleagues for their questions, um, uh, speak to the area of, of um, labs, which you made reference to. How much connectivity is there with 
CDC and those labs? Are they at a basic level? Uh, when I travel, I always ask about the labs myself. Matter of fact, we had a hearing in the last Congress about with Cure International and the magnificent work they're doing uh, with infection-based um, hydrocephalic condition. And they have cured over 5,000 children in Uganda alone with a simple intervention um, that, is, that does not require st uh, any stents. It doesn't require, you know, the kind of follow-up that we often would need here. But it is infection-based, they believe. Uh, and I watched one of the operations myself. The lab you mentioned in Uganda, I'm not sure if that lends itself to the kind of detection that they need to do uh, on this, but um, the labs, uh, where are they, particularly in Africa, but elsewhere in the world? Uh, how, how, do, how do we grow those labs as well as their sophistication and their connectivity to you? Thank you very much. Uh, the Advanced Molecular Detection Initiative would give our top quality disease detectives the cutting edge tools to find problems and stop them sooner. We have uh, terrific scientists at CDC. Um, we have a mandate within this country and abroad to, to detect and stop problems. But our hands are in some ways tied because we can't look into the microbes genome in the way that technology actually allows us to today. To give you just one example of that, with H7N9 influenza, which we can talk about more a bit later, we're very concerned to see, will it develop the capacity to spread easily from person to person? So far, we're confident it hasn't. If it does, it has major implications for all of us and for every country. We think we could learn more if we could go into clinical specimens and sequence the entire genetic material in those specimens. What happens when you grow an organism is that one particular strain grows very well, and you can analyze that in the laboratory. But that's not actually what's happening in the patient's body. What's happening in the patient's body is that there are many different, uh, an assortment of different substrains, or what are sometimes called quasi-species, of that organism. And by sequencing from there, you can figure out what is going to happen. You can skate to where the puck is going, not where the puck is. AMD, Advanced Molecular Detection, would allow us to do that, not just for influenza, but for other organisms as well. It's a critical tool in helping us not only avoid problems, but prevent them in the future. The, uh, the laboratories were very encouraged by the progress around the world. I think there are two broad areas where we're going to see more progress. The one is what are called point-of-care tests, things that a doctor or nurse or other health worker can do at the patient's bedside or at the patient's hut side. Uh, things that use a dipstick, as we're using in uh, Uganda with plague now. So these are great technologies because they take not much time. They're highly accurate. It's how we're diagnosing HIV and malaria now in the field. The other are the high-tech things, where we can go in and look at a specimen, and there are now technologies which can look at two dozen different organisms to say, in this one specimen of blood or sputum, which of these organisms are present. We've already used this on an experimental basis, for example, to look at an outbreak that we couldn't figure out what, what was causing it. And to our surprise, it was a yellow fever outbreak. And because of that, we were able to do control measures. So uh, there, there is the ability to bring these new technologies to bear on laboratories throughout the world. Uh, the African Society of Laboratory Medicine, which PEPFAR helped to start, has made really progress by leaps and bounds. In fact, uh, the Ethiopian government has given them, the African Union has given them free space. Uh, countries all over Africa are doing more with that. In Africa, they're, they're being very willing to do regionalization so that not every country needs to create everything. It's not efficient. They can work regionally very effectively. Our polio labs, our measles labs, our influenza labs, our foodborne labs are a global network where all of us are safer if every country can do a better job finding and tracking them. Before I yield to Ms. Bass, is there an inventory of all of those labs that could be made a part of the record and would give us a better sense of, and it also would be a place that when we do travel, we will visit? Um, we will certainly get you uh, what we have in terms sure. of an inventory. I'll also mention that uh, Congress um, requested that CDC do summaries of CDC's laboratory work last year and this year. So we have two reports on laboratory work that CDC does in this country and around the world, and we'd be delighted to share those as well as the global laboratory network information. Thank you so much. And Ms. Bass. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, once again, thank you for your testimony. And I do look forward to, I was saying to the chairman, I, I would love to go to Atlanta and to see the CDC. Um, so I hope to do that in the future. You know, I wanted to ask you to address two areas. And one is, uh, especially, you know, you said that internationally you thought there were good news on the political framework. So a couple of international issues I'd like for you to address as to how countries are dealing with the unregulated sell of, of antibiotics. I mean, you know, you can get them over the counter uh, in a lot of different countries. And how you are uh, relating to countries and trying to get them to stop that practice. Uh, the other thing is uh, on counterfeit drugs. And how prevalent do you think that is? You know, I have heard, it's only anecdotal though, but I've certainly heard that there's a lot of countries, countries in Africa and also uh, many other countries around the world that are buying medications that they think are legitimate and, and they are not. So both of those problems are big problems and I don't think we have uh, great news in terms of what's happening today to address them. But we do have a pretty clear pathway to get there. Uh, on the unregulated sale of antibiotics, fundamentally this is a question of strengthening governmental public sector capacity to do core things that we take for granted in this country. We take for granted in this country that you can't go to the local pharmacy and pick up the latest antibiotic because you think maybe you need it. Uh, there is control over the use of antibiotics. I think many countries are not in that world yet. And one of the things that we do at CDC and the FDA does as well is to work with partner governments, both the public sector and the private sector, to strengthen their capacity to do those core governmental capacities that they need to have and that will protect them and us. As an example, the government of India has recently passed rules outlawing uh, an inaccurate test for tuberculosis that was being used very widely in India uh, and, and very misleadingly. So people were being told they didn't have TB when they did and that they did have TB when they didn't. They've also ruled that you can't get TB over the market. Well, it's, it's wonderful that they've taken those steps to have those rules so that people would need a prescription and you would have an accurate test. The next step is get them implemented effectively. And that's something that uh, with any country we're willing to partner to help them get it right because that helps them and it helps us. Can, In I, terms can I ask you a little bit, just one question about that? How about Mexico? Any, um, you know, living in Los Angeles, I'm just two hours from the border, and a lot of times people do go across the border to get antibiotics and bring them back. We also had a problem in Los Angeles, frankly, with people selling them over the counter at swap meets and different places. How, what, if, what is our relationship with Mexico? Um, we've, we have a longstanding relationship with Mexico. We have at CDC binational programs, especially for some of the border areas. Uh, Mexico has a very robust public health system. In terms of antibiotic availability, I would have to find out and get back to you. Okay. Um, in terms of counterfeit drugs, mm -hmm. I don't think we have a good sense of the scope of the problem. We know it's a risk. Uh, we're very concerned about counterfeit artemisinins, which we've seen, and we're very concerned about the continued sale of monotherapy with artemisinin. One of the great ways to protect antibiotics is to give them in pairs or groups of three or four. This makes a huge difference because it reduces the risk that if you develop resistance, it will spread. Right. Uh, this is one of the key lessons from tuberculosis and from HIV, that by using multiple drugs together, you can cure patients more effectively and prevent the emergence of drug resistance. So the sale of monotherapy, artemisinin alone, is just a terrible thing. It should never happen. And one of the things that we need to do more of is work with WHO, work with other international organizations, work with individual countries on reducing both counterfeit and irrational uh, drug formulations on the market. So then do you think that the counterfeiting of drugs is not that big of a problem? I mean, it's talked about huge, and I, I don't know if it, if it is playing that big of a role well, I in think drug resistance. I think I, what I was trying to say is I don't think we know how big of a problem oh, it is. Okay. Um, we know that there are many problems of which that is one. And uh, the FDA has some new technologies that they're looking at which may help countries to identify counterfeit drugs more easily. A lot of this involves strengthening national regulatory authorities in other countries. That may sound like something, why would we want to do that? But we want to do that because we don't want 
people anywhere getting drugs that they shouldn't be getting or drugs that are ineffective when their resistance will soon be just a, a plane ride away from, from us in the U.S. We've already seen this happen with patients from Asia coming here and creating outbreaks of disease. The answer to this isn't to close our, to, to try to say we're going to keep all microbes out. We are a globalized world, whether it's in our food supply, whether it's in our medications, whether it's in uh, the travelers from the U.S. who go abroad and come back, or people who come here, and in the case of tuberculosis, may have been here for decades uh, and then develop a, 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 an infection or an active infection with tuberculosis. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weber. Wow, where do I start? Um, I think you might have answered it, Doctor. You said in the chip, you held up the chip, and you said the chip was instrumental, I think, in the detection of H7N9. And then you mentioned it had, oh, I don't know how many pieces of information on it. Would you go back through that again, please? Sure. And, and if, if you'd like, I'll also talk some about H7N9 at some point. Okay. But the, this chip allows you to, to take either a culture that you have in the laboratory or a patient's specimen, blood or urine, and then to isolate the DNA, and put it in these wells, and then through testing, figure out what DNA is in it. So what organism it is, whether it encodes, the DNA encodes for resistance genes, whether when we learn more, whether it's related to other organisms. So two people may have the same species infection, but they may be totally unrelated, or they may have gotten it one from the other. That kind of information can come from this kind of technology, but we need to learn more about it. We need to invest in it. We need to study the genome of many of the organisms that are causing human illness. Does that give you, us the ability to look at that DNA and say some um, strings of DNA are more resistant to drugs than others? Yes. It would allow you to say which of the strains are more dangerous. I should, uh, I should give the caveat that this is only effective if it's done along with a lot of our traditional tools of laboratory work and what we call shoe leather epidemiology, going out, asking people questions, figuring out who's sick, figuring out who's resistant, and who had contact where with who. Okay, so this gives the ability to predict, for lack of a better term, I think the phrase you used was to skate to where the puck not is, but going to be. That's, that's what we hope it will do. Yeah, Wayne Kresge, he said That's over right. here. Okay, I didn't know he was a doctor. But uh, so when you, what, what does that look like? I mean, you're, you, are you anticipating strains evolving? What, what do you mean by that? So we could see within an individual patient with influenza, uh, in our current way of doing it, we can only see one dominant strain. With the new technology, we would actually see many strains that are in their body and making them sick. Some of those strains may be drug resistant. Some of them, in the case of H7, may have picked up the ability to spread person to person. We don't know that yet. That's something we'll be tracking very, very closely as H7 progresses and as we learn more about it. And then you do what? You, you skate to where the, the medicine that he or she needs? We might, for example, use a different drug to treat that patient. We might change the way we create the vaccine so that the parts of the vaccine that are active are active against a different strain of the virus or a different type of the virus. So it would help us to both find it and stop it and prevent it. So when you do that, when you have this data, and I forget how many pieces you said was on there, hundreds of millions, I'm sure, are you able to get that into a database that says, okay, we can share this and we know, and then you name this, at some point somebody named the H7N9. And so at what point do you determine that a particular strain is wide, is wide and it gets a name? How do you determine, who determines that and when does that happen? So for influenza, we have a, a, a really a wonderful global partnership. We work with more than 50 countries. We work with the World Health Organization. And after the SARS epidemic in China, the Chinese got very interested in improving their system. So we've worked very closely with them to set up systems to track influenza, 
to help them develop their laboratory abilities to be able to detect it and to do the genetic sequence of influenza. Um, and in fact, we helped them become a World Health Organization collaborating center on influenza. And that's important because as a collaborating center, they are required to post on the internet the entire gene sequence of the uh, every new H influenza organism that they sequence, and they're happy to do so. So within days of receiving the first sample, the China CDC, which is the collaborating center there, um, had posted on, had sequenced the genome in ways that we had helped them to do, and then posted that on the internet. We brought that sequence down and used the sequence to create a test to see if someone has this organism. We've already had about two dozen people in this country coming back from China with severe illness who we've tested in our laboratories. None of them have had this. We don't think any have had it yet um, of the ones that are still pending. But in addition, we've already begun through what's called reverse engineering to make a vaccine against H7 based on this information from the internet. That's all great, but there's actually a next generation of genetic work that can be even more powerful and allow us to see in advance. We only saw this once it had made over, once it had made a bunch of people sick. It's now made over 100 people sick in China. Well, and that's my question. How do you know over here in this country, how do you get that word out? At what point do you know that these people, do they have a common theme? They've been overseas, I guess. So for the H7N9, if I can just address that for a moment, uh, influenza is, of all of the infectious diseases, the one that can kill the most people. During the 1918 pandemic, more than 50 million people around the world died. Uh, the, the death rate among people who got the virus in 1918 was around 1.7%. Now, in an average flu year in the U.S., average seasonal flu year, about 20 percent of people, 60 million Americans, get the flu. So if a virus could be that severe and infect that many people, it would be of enormous risk. Knock out 6,000 people, basically. Um, if you went and more than that at 1.7 percent of 60 million. So that's why flu we take so very seriously, and we track it all around the world. In fact, uh, the southern hemisphere tends to get flu before we do, and we use the pattern there to decide which strains of flu to put into the virus for the coming year. And they use, for the next year, what happens here. So it's really a global collaboration on influenza. H7N9 is, is a new scenario. We've never seen anything quite like this before in China. Um, and there are aspects of it that are reassuring, there are aspects that are not reassuring, and there are things that we're specifically doing. So what's, uh, what's, I'll tell you the most reassuring thing about the bird flu in China now, the H7, is that it is not spreading from one person to another efficiently, and we're quite confident in that. The Chinese government has checked more than 2,000 contacts of people with flu, and they found only a very small handful of secondary cases, whereas with the usual flu, we might expect to see as many as 20 or 30 percent of those people sick. So we're not seeing spread, and we're seeing most of the cases had contact with birds, ducks, pigeons, quail, uh, uh, or chickens. Um, so what's reassuring is we're not seeing person-to-person -person spread. We're also seeing very good collaboration with the Chinese authorities. In fact, the head of our flu program is there now on a World Health Organization delegation and getting great collaboration. The Chinese government has asked us to send them three of our top experts in flu to work with them for weeks and months to come so that they can do everything possible to get ahead of it. Um, and for 10 years, we've been increasing our preparedness for threats and working better across the U.S. government. That's the good news. The not so reassuring news is that this particular strain of bird flu, H7, is severe. So of the 100 people or so who've gotten it, about 20 have died, and many of the remaining are quite sick. Um, we also don't see birds getting sick from it. Now, you might say that's a good thing, but it's not, because with H5N1, another bird flu that we've been tracking for 10 years, with H5, the birds get sick, and the country culls the flock, and it stops spreading. Here, the birds aren't sick, so you can't cull the flock. You don't have that marker. And H5, the other bird flu, spread all over the world in years. So it started in Asia and soon was all over the Middle East and Africa. Um, and for H5, um, we, 
we, uh, we, it took about 18 months bef between the time the first case came and we had 100 cases. H1 re was recognized on April 1st of this year and we already have 100 cases. So there are things that we're very concerned about and what the genome looks like and creating a vaccine is particularly challenging for these types of virus. Um, but our plan for addressing flu basically uses four pillars that the Department of Health and Human Services coordinates. The first is tracking, so we know what's happening. The second is mitigation, figuring out how we can reduce damage if it comes by treating people and helping them survive flu by good care in hospitals. Third is um, vaccine development. Vaccine development in influenza takes at least six months. And for H7, it's likely to require probably two doses and maybe an adjuvant because the human body doesn't respond well to this. And uh, communication. We're very upfront. We have a fundamental rule. Tell them what you know when you know it. Tell them what you don't know and how you're trying to find out. And that's our approach to, to this. The, the bottom line with H7 is that currently it is not spreading person to person. If it does not gain that capacity, it will not cause a pandemic. But I cannot predict if it will and if it does, if it's going to be tomorrow or in 10 years. Sure. Let me, one final question, if I may, Mr. Chairman. In your, in your remarks, you said there were four trends, and your fourth trend was the potential uh, for folks to intentionally or unintentionally create dangerous organisms and release them, um, which got my attention because in, in all this talk about, you know, biological warfare, for example, um, with all of these databases up on the, on the web you talked about where they identify a strain, they, they're supposed to post it as a member of the WHO, um, do you guys work with uh, our, uh, for national security reasons, work with our, the branch of government that would track something like that? And I don't know if you can really go into it. How do you identify that strain, if you will, and how do you know who's working on it? So within this country, within the United States, uh, CDC operates something that looks at what are called select agents, so things that could be used for terrorist purposes or could be dangerous if they got out of the laboratory. There are currently about 354 laboratories in this country that work with one or another toxin or select agent. We, uh, we're generally not a regulatory agency unless you want to import or work with plague or something like it in your laboratory, in which case we will do the regulation. Um, and for each of these laboratories, we do on-site visits and we oversee them and we ensure that both the workers there don't get infected, because if they got infected, they could bring it outside and they could be very sick. And um, there's, uh, we do everything possible to minimize the risk of spread. Well, I'm not too concerned about the laboratories that are here. I was concerned about your example or, for example, other foreign countries posted their stuff online, if they find something that is so bad that there's really a, hardly a cure for it, what would keep them from just sending it over to our country? That's really my, my question. Yep. Uh, the risk of biological warfare is real. Do you all track that? We do. And we also uh, retain under our jurisdiction the strategic national stockpile. It is uh, countermeasures for natural or man-made disaster that we can deploy to anywhere in the U.S. within 12 hours. So if you see a country that's hostile to, our, to America, of course, they probably aren't going to post that on, on the web. That's the catch-22. Um, if they come up with something like that, there's no good way for us to have a preventive vaccine in place uh, without foreknowledge. Well, we look at all the potential risks. So we have scientists at CDC who are essentially the world's experts in just about all of the threats that could be faced. We know, for example, that smallpox is something that we've been very concerned about someone reintroducing in the world. CDC, working with the World Health Organization, eradicated smallpox from the world. But we've been concerned that someone might bring it back as a terrorist agent. We have in the stockpile enough vaccine to vaccinate the country. So we're, we've essentially taken that risk off okay. the table. Um, not all risks are that uh, amenable to our intervention, but we both track and think of how to prepare. And I, I would mention that the advanced molecular detection allows us to do a very specific fingerprinting of strains, which would help us in identifying the source of it. 
So there's something that has additional benefits as okay, well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Weber. Mr. Burr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and my apologies, Dr. Frieden, if you've been asked this question, but in my um, opening statement, I you know, talked a little bit about how we come up with the next generation of antibiotics and certainly extend the life of those antibiotics. Part of the challenge that, that we face is, you know, as our domestic pharmaceutical companies and global pharmaceutical companies look at um, making those investments and, and, and the amount of research that goes into um, developing that next generation and then the return on that investment. You know, many of the, these companies are making those cost-benefit analysis and realizing you know, the, the costs are prohibitive. So clearly the federal government has a, a role in making sure we're providing adequate resources and funding, you know, creating that partnership between industry and um, academia to do this research and, and develop the, the next generation. But the critical question here is, as we're making those investments, we certainly want to extend the life of these therapeutics. Um, you know, and we are seeing, you know, I was reading my home medical journal, the Annals of Internal Medicine, um, in this latest issue, and they were touching on the increasing incidence of CRE and, and you know, the, the impact that that's having and potentially will have in, in the future. What are some um, thoughts that, that you might have as we come up with this next generation to both um, protect and extend the life of these, um, the, these discoveries here domestically, but then also, you know, we talk about the ease of obtaining antibiotics overseas in, in third world countries. What are some creative things that we can do here in Congress working with industry to, again, um, you know, extend the life? I, I think uh, everything you say is a, a critical issue. We need to figure out how to preserve the antibiotics we have now and ensure that as new antibiotics come online, which we anticipate and hope they will, we don't lose them as quickly as we've lost some of the current ones. Uh, the amount of antibiotic usage in the U.S. is actually astonishing. CDC just published data on this uh, within the past week, I believe. Um, there are more than a quarter of a billion, B, quarter of a billion courses of antibiotics prescribed in this country each year. About eight courses of antibiotics for every 10 people in the country. Um, and in some parts of the country, it's 12 for every 10 people. So I think we really have to work on antibiotic stewardship, making sure that when people need antibiotics, they get them, and when they don't need them, they don't get them. And CDC has uh, sponsored some antibiotic stewardship programs which have been shown to save money for facilities. They require an investment. You've got to have staff doing them, but they pay off. Uh, and this is something that's really quite important. Um, in terms of the pipeline of how to get new antibiotics, um, the NIH is critical in that regard, and the FDA as well is figuring out ways to help companies bring products to the market sooner and at lower cost so that we can address this gap because we don't have a lot of great antibiotics in the pipeline. Um, in terms of preserving antibiotics, I talked briefly before about the new antibiotic for tuberculosis, which we are trying to do just that with, saying let's just reserve this for the patients for whom there are no other options while we figure out the best uh, mechanism for it. As you know as a doctor, Dr. Barra, uh, if you use antibiotics correctly, you won't get drug resistance. A lot of the things that we need to do are fairly simple and straightforward. Getting healthcare workers to wash their hands, removing urinary catheters and, and uh, intravenous lines very promptly and only using them when essential, uh, getting patients off ventilators as rapidly as possible, reducing healthcare associated infection. And CDC's healthcare associated infection program does that in this country. Other countries, particularly low and middle income countries, are not doing uh, much in that area. And that's an area we would like to expand work on, but we're unable to for, for lack of resources. You know, you've touched on, uh, on a couple areas. Um, I'm astonished at the number of courses of antibiotics. I didn't reali I realize there was a lot being prescribed. I didn't realize it was that high. Are there best practices that um, can that we can um, make sure you know, physicians around the country are, are utilizing that have been shown to be effective? So, you know, for years we've been talking about appropriate an antibiotic um, prescriptions and prescribing habits. Um, are there best practices that you've seen and um, effective models? Yes, we, we have seen 
antibiotic stewardship models that really make a difference. Uh, we have a program at CDC called Get Smart about antibiotics, and uh, we think it's important to involve both the clinicians and the community because the clinicians will say to us, you know, the patient came in and they demanded antibiotics, and they said, if I don't give them to me, they're going to go to the guy down the, down the street. So I, I think it is important to get uh, more awareness that antibiotics, no medicine is without risk. So things should absolutely be taken when they're needed, but not be taken when they're not needed. And I think that's the essence of the best practice. We've often seen that getting uh, non-doctors involved in the system, pharmacists, nurses, uh, allied health workers, can be very important. And uh, the other thing that's been very effective is to track the prescribing trends of different doctors, not as a way of criticizing someone, but providing feedback. And if there are outliers, providing them that information and education so that they can do a better job. When I worked in tuberculosis control, we were able to standardize treatment for tuberculosis across an entire city, an entire country, using outreach workers to reach out to, to doctors, private doctors, in case the prescription wasn't appropriate or rational, and just provide them with education and information so we can improve the quality of care. Great. Um, you know, just one last question. My colleague, um, Mr. Weber, touched on um, the threat of biological agents and, and so forth, and the imminent threat here locally or, or domestically. Um, you know, in this, in the full committee, we've certainly um, had a few hearings on Syria. Um, you know, a, a country that you know increasingly. Um, looks like it's going to fall, and a country that we know possesses some of these biological agents. Um, are, are there, you know, a, as we prepare ourselves for, you know, all, all threats and, and so forth, is there anything that you'd like to see from, from this body in terms of helping the CDC make sure that, that we're fully prepared for? Well, at CDC, we work 24-7 protecting Americans from threats, whether they're natural or man-made, whether they're infectious or environmental, whether they're from this country or abroad. Uh, what we do, frankly, is dependent on the resources we're provided. So when we have fewer resources, that means the resources that we provide to state and local entities to detect and respond to problems are less. That means the resources we have to work globally are less. Um, sequestration has had broad and serious impacts on CDC's ability to detect and respond to a wide variety of problems. We understand that we're in fiscally constrained times, we've done a lot to be more efficient to make sure that as much of our money that we're entrusted goes out for direct program services, but uh, we are concerned that our ability to respond uh, is really at the breaking point in some of our programs. Great. Thank you for... Thank you. Mr. Meadows. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your, your illuminating testimony. And uh, one of the areas that I want to... Uh, uh, Broach is Dr. Barra and I actually have uh, had a, a lead letter together where we uh, had Dr. Collins come in with uh, NIH, National Institutes of Health, and he was sharing some of the groundbreaking, exciting uh, research that uh, they've been doing, uh, particularly in influenza. And so what kind of uh, correlation or, or partnership has there been with that group and, and what can be learned from, from that partnership? Because as he was sharing, you know, right now we treat and he described it, it's kind of like a mushroom and we, you know, every year you get a flu shot and you're, you know, it's a different strain and we're, we're coming up with that and that there's a hope that one day we'll be able to, in the not too distant future, just have one shot for that stem that uh, from a DNA perspective uh, helps us address that. So are, are you working with them in, 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 in what ways? We work very closely with NIH, with FDA, with other parts of HHS. In fact, in the H7N9 response, we're having twice weekly uh, coordination calls to make sure we're perfectly aligned. Um, what we're finding uh, really, what NIH is working on, we really hope will work out. They're, they're right. doing the basic research to try to come up with a universal, long-lasting flu vaccine. This right. would be phenomenal. Um, right now, our flu vaccine works okay. It doesn't work as well as most of our vaccines. You have to take it every year. Sometimes we have a mismatch, and it doesn't right. ma meet the strains. If you look at something like H7, it doesn't work particularly well. You have to give two doses and maybe an adjuvant. Right. So we have real challenges, and we ardently hope that they will succeed. 
our job really is to take what is existing knowledge and turn it into practice. That's the CDC space. Okay. Take what we know how to do and get it happening as broadly as possible to protect as many people as possible. And we're, we're able through our laboratory, for example, to accelerate and improve some of the current vaccine development techniques. We're able through our laboratory to cut a month off vaccine production time through a new technology that we've developed. So it, it really is a partnership across the system. All right, so, so you mentioned the FDA, and, and obviously there is, is this where you're analyzing and seeing the issue and identifying the problem, so to speak, and then we've got to figure out a way, how do, how do we deal with the problem? And so there are a number of components there. One would be the FDA, the other would be uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, what are the barriers that you face right now with either sharing that information or, or speeding up the process? Uh, you know, if, if, if you're identifying the issue, how, how do we make sure that as quickly as possible that we, uh, that we see the enemy and that we know how to fight it and with, um, with drugs or whatever? What are the barriers that you're seeing there? I think within the federal system, we're very well aligned. And I, I honestly might not have said that a few years ago, but uh, whether- So that's, that's part of the government that's working well, is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, just to take food safety as an example, right. we have weekly reviews with both USDA and FDA on every potential cluster and investigate those that make sense. On influenza development, we're really very tightly aligned between FDA, USDA, uh, NIH, and ourselves. So for example, uh, if we go forward to make vaccine for H7, even trial vaccine, right. it would be part of HHS that contracts for that. It would be NIH that does the clinical trials. It would be FDA that licenses it. So I think that's going well. There are at least two areas where we, we face real challenges. One of them is, as I've mentioned, our limitation in being able to do some of the advanced molecular work that would right. open doors and make things visible that are currently invisible to us. Right. The second are sometimes some of the incentives. Uh, private sector is a crucial partner in this work, but for some of the work, they, they don't have the incentive to do what might make the most, uh, might do the most good, either because a product wouldn't pay or because the market isn't necessarily there. If we don't have an H7 pandemic, there'll be no market for the vaccine. So there are areas where the government needs to step in because there's, there's no natural incentive for it. Um, new antibiotics are an area where we're trying to get the incentives right because it does cost so much money to develop a new antibiotic. How do we make sure that if they do get one to market, it's preserved and they can get a return on their substantial investment to bring it to market. So I think those are two of the issues that we're looking at more. All right, and so let, let's look at that prioritization because I think you've, you've come up and, and you've said, okay, we've, you know, we need, you know, we've got fiscal constraints. We've, we've got, uh, you know, a priority on where, where we are in terms of our investment on these. How would you look at, the, at those, those areas and prioritize them? I mean, uh, I'm, I've got a number of friends that have worked for the CDC. I mean, they come up to the mountains of North Carolina to get away, and so I get to see them on a regular basis. Um, and, and all of them very dedicated, uh, capable individuals. Uh, I, I still at times, though, see the CDC, what I believe may have mission creep in terms of getting into areas that are uh, tangentially maybe have to do with um, uh, disease, uh, for example. I mean, I was real surprised to see some of the advertising done by the CDC with regards to gun control. Uh, you know, there was there was an issue there that, that came up, and I was just blown away that, that there would even be anything there. And so, um, how, how can you, or who is the best person to prioritize those things for us? Well, first, um, I'm not aware of any advertising uh, CDC has done on gun violence, so if there's any example of that, I'd like to see it. Get you uh, a copy of it. Uh, I think the bottom line for us is a return on investment return on investment, both in terms of health and in terms of dollars. So um, with influenza, as an example, we are looking at what will be the return on investment from a better vaccine. Now, we hope we'll come up with a universal vaccine. It might or might not happen. But we know that if we can increase right. the use of existing tools, we can tamp down the impact of influenza. Uh, for many of the vaccines, 
we know that if we got to higher vaccination rates, we'd have less disease in the future. In fact, vaccines are a great example of that. For every $1 we spend on vaccines, we get $3 back in healthcare savings and $10 back in societal savings. So I think, for me, the key concept is the return on investment. It's not something we do because it makes us feel good or, or we oh, think no, it's... Oh, no, no, and, it's, it's and I realize that. And I guess my, my question becomes is, is how do we share the issue of how um, concerning the, these issues are without creating panic, panic and yet at the same time, because, you know, funding becomes, you know, you only go to the doctor when you know you're sick. And, and a lot of these issues uh, are, are here that are out there that, that, quite frankly, the average person on Main Street have no idea that the threat exists. So how do, how do we share that information where we build public, you know, public consensus and yet at the same time not create um, a, a fear, you know, where everybody's running around on Main Street with masks on their face? So uh, right now, for H7, as an example, there's nothing for people to do differently. As a right. family member, as a parent, there's nothing that I'm advising my family to do differently for 10 because, years. Because of the contagious nature that you talked about earlier. That's right. Is, okay. For 10 years, we've told people, if you visit China, don't go to live markets. That was to protect you against SARS and avian right. influenza and other things. And that remains our advice. And that's sure. essentially the only thing different. For us at CDC, it's different. We've activated our emergency operations center. We're tracking it 24-7. We're sending teams out to look at it. We're working with state and local governments. We're working with neighboring countries. So there's a lot that we're doing. I think the issue of building consensus is, is a challenging one, and it really gets to the heart of this hearing, I think, which is how do we ensure that there is a widespread recognition that in terms of global health threats, we are inevitably interconnected that a risk anywhere is a risk everywhere, that a blind spot anywhere puts us all at risk. And, and that's something that I think uh, all of us can, can think together on how to convey that most effectively. So you think the, the, the federal answer, and this is my last question, Mr. Chairman, uh, if you think the federal answer to that would be to prioritize those, identify those areas as we did with smallpox when, when there was a potential uh, um, risk with smallpox after 9-11 and identify those areas uh, that may not have a pharmaceutical pay, payback, so to speak, uh, and, and say that's where the federal government needs to get involved in, and the others leave it to the private sector? Um, yes, in general. Um, I would say uh, that uh, it's not an either or. There are very important public-private partnerships where, say, take the example of the cell-based flu manufacturing capacity that the public sector invested in, but Novartis also invested in. Right. So I think there, there's partnerships possible there. In terms of the gaps, we've talked about the advanced molecular t detection. We've also talked about the global health security and the need to have that network around the world, because if any country's weak, we're all at higher risk. And ultimately, things like vaccines can take diseases off the table, but require more investment or where we've got the vaccine, investment to get, get it into people. Okay. Uh, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Dr. Frieden, you've been very generous with your time. If I could just ask a couple of following um, uh, final questions and perhaps uh, any uh, colleague who would like to ask a final question as well. You mentioned the drug-resistant gonorrhea. Uh, if you perhaps could speak to how prevalent that is that you saw or we saw strains and we being the government detected in Asia, and now it's been observed around the world, including the United States. On MRSA, is that something that is multiplying globally uh, and at what rate, perhaps? Um, I, on one trip to Korea, met with a, a number of people, but one of them was a priest who was actually doing work in Pyongyang uh, to help uh, multi-resistant TB and XDR TB affected um, patients who were unbelievably sick, obviously, and yet he was allowed in, and, and in that case, Kim Jong-il was welcomed him because he was doing such a great humanitarian uh, initiative. Uh, when you have a country like North Korea, or perhaps Iran, or, or perhaps um, Eritrea, or some other uh, country where you know, some human rights abusers like China and even Vietnam do welcome, and thankfully they welcome, you know, the collaboration to try to mitigate and, and stop disease spread, but a country like North Korea, uh, that's not happening. And it seems to me, do you have any recommendations uh, on what could be done, you know, to, to build that bridge uh, 
because obviously I'm sure CDC would love to be there helping to eradicate something like or help people with, with uh, drug-resistant um, uh, 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 tuberculosis. Let me also just ask you briefly if you could comment on the, maybe you might not want to, but the $236 million last year's budget for, for FY12 will be cut by $45 million in the President's budget for TB uh, to $191 million. I mean, yes, these are hard times, but it seems to me that that money, minimally straight lining it, if not increasing it, is every dollar is well spent. And finally, um, back in the early 80s, when the child survival revolution, uh, Jim Grant and all the others at UNICEF, and of course our government was pushing hard for it, uh, David Stockman came along as OMB director and zeroed out the, on the, its second year, the child survival uh, emphasis on vaccines or rehydration therapy and the like. Uh, I offered the amendment to double it, <laughs> to go to double down and say, not only should we not eradicate that money or, or end that money, I should say, uh, we need to increase it. And I did travel to El Salvador and many other places when, when vaccination days were, were called and pertussis, diphtheria, and other killers of children, uh, kids were vaccinated against it. Now, this is obviously several decades later, and I'm wondering, are we, are we hitting all the diseases? Uh, are any of those diseases, like pertussis or, or, or um, diphtheria, uh, morphing into something that becomes drug resistant? Um, we thought we were on our way to eradication and universal immunization, but obviously they keep rearing their ugly head. Um, I mean, we need to redouble our efforts on the child survival effort as well, if you could speak to that. Thank you so much. Uh, on drug-resistant gonorrhea, we've seen an increasing proportion of strains in this country and around the world that are resistant to the cephalosporins. So earlier, uh, just a few months ago, we issued new treatment guidelines to use two drugs for patients, not one, because again, using two will reduce that emergence. Um, we know that uh, it is a problem globally, and we will have to uh, address it globally. There's a lot of global transmission, and um, what we've seen is the need to have that kind of action. We've worked very actively with the World Health Organization to track it. In terms of MRSA, I think there's very limited evidence or knowledge about where it is globally. So that's one of the things that we'd like to work with other countries on to further develop. But we do know that in this country, we've been able to substantially reduce invasive MRSA through some common sense, low cost ways of reducing infections in hospitals. Uh, I agree with you completely that health is often a great way to foster collaboration. I mean, look at the partnership, steadfast partnership over the past 10 years with China on influenza and other infectious diseases, regardless of what else may be happening. Or if you look at smallpox eradication, uh, that was done when the Soviet Union still existed. There was a partnership between the CDC, the US, and the Soviet Union for smallpox eradication. So health can be a safe space, and the days of tranquility that you mentioned uh, of James Grant and UNICEF were a very inspiring example of that, where people actually stopped the war to vaccinate kids. Um, I, I can't comment on the budget on TB. I believe that's the USAID budget that you're referring to. Uh, in terms of the child survival revolution and what's happening now, Vaccinations remain uh, one of the great accomplishments of all time in humanity. There are, take measles alone, there are about 10 million children who would be dead who are alive today because of measles vaccination. It's low cost, it's highly effective. Um, we know that there are limits to vaccines. For example, our pertussis vaccine doesn't work as well as we would like. Uh, many countries are not using the vaccines that we know work. So rubella vaccines have to be used at a high rate or you actually can do more harm than good. Uh, so the vaccine work is very important. Uh, one thing that has been very encouraging is Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, which is funding and uh, creating an incentive for companies to sell at a reasonable price vaccines around the world and the vaccine manufacturers have been wonderful partners in this. Uh, the result of that is that new vaccines against rotavirus, something that CDC helped develop, um, against pneumococcal disease, which killed lots of kids each year, and against Haemophilus, are being introduced around the world. Uh, we still have much further to go to make sure that every child in the world can have the potential of receiving those vaccines. Um, and there are some new vaccines that we are hoping to see developed in the coming years. But 
Right now, we've got kind of a full plate getting these scaled up. We've worked in Haiti, for example, to help that country implement new vaccination programs at a higher rate for the three of the leading killers that they were never vaccinating for against before uh, post-earthquake. So rotavirus, pneumococcal, and haemophilus, major killers, at least probably 10,000 deaths per year per pathogen, and those are getting introduced last year, this year, and next year in Haiti. So uh, I think it's a great example of how much can be accomplished in global health, and I really thank the committee, the chairman, um, for how much that you've done in, in this area. Um, at CDC, we also have searing memories of the zeroing out of the child's survival revolution because we were expanding vaccination, and a lot of children could have had a, a fuller, longer life if that program hadn't been stopped. Doctor, anything you'd like to say in conclusion? or Only to thank you again for your attention to these issues and to emphasize that despite all the problems, despite all the threats, despite all of the risks, I remain fundamentally optimistic. We have commitment and we have tools. We have great people. We have will in this country and around the world. There's a broad consensus in this country and around the world of what needs to be done, and I'm confident that we'll make even more progress in the future. Thank you so very much for your great testimony, but more importantly, your leadership. It's making a huge difference and deeply appreciated by this committee. Thank you. Thank you very much.